Rob. How's it going? It goes great. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, hopefully it goes better this week. Um, I think we were the first uh, podcast in history to commit a wardrobe malfunction last week. <laughs> Uh, for sure. I tried to cut out as much as possible. So I don't know if our listeners um, caught on to the scrunching sound that you can yes. hear in the first five minutes of that of last week's podcast. That's right. So if you, you can't see us record this, but if you could, you could see that Kelly has a what I'm going to guess is at least a thousand dollar value microphone. It looks totally pro. You look like a radio announcer right now. Meanwhile, I have my vintage circa 2012 iPhone headphones with the mic built in and it's banging like as I talk it bangs against my sweater which had a like zipper it's doing on it right week. now and is it still well just now when you move too much okay I'll try to stay perfectly still and you know one day we're gonna get the audio issues figured out and locked down so uh, time. we'll save everyone's ears um, in the future. Yes. Yeah, so I apologize for all that clicking uh, noise before we figured out what the hell was going on uh, in the last episode. Well, thankfully, I can safely report that we did not get any complaints on our Instagram. So oh, no good. mailbag this week. But that being said, uh, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at behind the curling. Whatever that is. Something that we always forget to plug, but we're <laughs> plugging it now. All right, Kelly, I got a trivia question for you. Shout. Okay. So uh, I was looking up how all the, because we talked about international curling last week, and there are tons of curling federations, many that I didn't know. So mm -hmm. I'm going to, multiple choice question. Which okay. of these countries does not have a WCF recognition? Is it Guyana, the Dominican Republic, Argentina, or Mongolia? Mongolia definitely has one. I remember seeing that or hearing about it. Um. I'm debating between Dominican Republic and Argentina because mm. Argentina is a big enough country that if All they right. did oh. have rec recognition, you would know about it. Well, uh, who wants to be a millionaire this? We'll use the 50-50 and I'll tell you it's down to those two. I'm going to go with Argentina, final answer. You were right. Very good. Yeah. Dominican Republic actually has a curling federation. I chose Argentina because it's the first country that popped into my head with the uh, the late Diego Maradona, Maradona mm. as of this week. Uh, but yeah, they don't have a federation as far as what I see. I'm and the surprised. Reason we're, yeah, me they too, don't. being a big enough country. And I guess a lot of these countries that we're surprised to have, learn have curling going on them is because of mixed doubles. Not Which a great segue, a but segue. that's what I got. That's what I got. <laughs> Yeah, so this week's episode is all about mixed doubles. Um, personally, one of my favorite games, even more than regular curling, I dare say. And something that I came around on, I, I kind of was eh, against it at the beginning, but I've I've since converted. You're definitely not the only one who feels that way, especially here in Canada, because let me tell you, uh, in my the little research that I did before this episode, Canada is not uh, not at the top of mixed doubles game and far from it. Very interesting. Even though they're the reigning gold medal champions at the Even Olympics? Even though we can talk about it right now, but uh, Canada has yet to win a gold medal at the World Curling Mixed Double Championships. Really? Which have been going on since 2008. Who are some of the gold medalists? Is it like the traditional countries that we think of? Yes and no. So Switzerland is a uh, reigning gold medal champion. So the first 10 years, I think they won like eight out of 10 of them. Oh, wow. But there are uh, some random countries. I don't want to say random, but um, some not... Uh, some the ones not, we don't expect to win when we think yeah, of Yeah, some less familiar curling. countries. Yeah, less familiar countries. Uh, so in 2013, Hungary won the oh, gold I seem medal. to remember that, yeah. But yeah, also, uh, so Sweden obviously has been, hasn't won as many gold medals, but they've definitely won a, quite a few silver. So they're like, they're uh, meddling. Russia too is another country uh, that we'll see. Um, but a lot of the smaller European countries that okay. don't have a strong regular curling game presence, they're succeeding at mixed doubles. Very interesting. I wonder why that is. I have a few thoughts <laughs> well, or uh, theories. What an unintentional segue. Take it away. I know. Uh, well, I guess kind of like what we talked about last week, how, you know, it is expensive <laughs> to get 
involved in curling um, yeah. and creating a four-man team and competing against other powerhouses such as Canada and Sweden and, and Switzerland. So it's just a lot, it's more feasible for these smaller countries who don't have the numbers to invest in two, two players as opposed to a four-man team. I guess we should also back up and just uh, acknowledge that mixed doubles is extremely different from traditional curling. Yes. I was trying to think of like the best way to explain it. And I was thinking, well, first, I don't know anything about auto racing or Formula One. I am not a fan. But I would say that mixed doubles is to curling what Mario Kart is to auto racing. It's the same premise, but with it just gets crazy. Um, to a certain extent, I don't know if that's the best analogy out there. No, but, but it was kind of fun. So. I know some people, and this is kind of why mixed doubles hasn't gotten much traction in Canada until now, is that some people did find it way too gimmicky, um, especially with the introduction of the power play, which, you know, as much as I love mixed doubles, I'm not super keen on the power play. You have the timeline here, you said, right? So when did this all... Um... Okay. So mixed doubles, a history. So this is according to Wikipedia. Again, I don't know the how most valuable source you're gonna find when it comes to researching curling. It is. I mean, these days, face it, Wikipedia you is your anything. first go to. Yeah. yeah. So mixed doubles was formalized by the WCF, the World Curling Federation, in two thousand and eight. Mm -hmm. So it's still a relatively new sport. However, in 2005, there are quite uh, significant changes uh, made to the game. Uh, why these changes were made, it's not too clear, but uh, these were the following. In 2015, the, the placement of the rock in the house at the start of the game was moved from behind the T-line to just in front of the back four. So essentially, the back of the rock should touch the back of the back four. Okay. Like the back end of the back four before the back eight. Okay. Yeah. All, right. all you curlers out there, I'm pretty sure you understand <laughs> what I'm talking about. I always um, thought it was the back of the button. So what do I know? It's, yeah. Well, I mean, it's pretty close because it's two feet and the rock is just under like two feet diameter. Um, but it really should be touching the back of the back four. Okay. Um, second, the teams no longer need to be separated. So prior to 2015, at the first throw, one player had to be at the other end holding the broom. However, I, as we've seen now, especially in the Olympics, a lot of the teams are choosing to not have anybody in the house in the first throw and just have that one sweeper because we all know, and we can talk about this later when it comes to strategy, that getting that first freeze is like key to yep. stealing an end. Uh, secondly, <laughs> uh, thirdly, and this we've seen a lot when we played uh, in the provincial playdowns, is if a rock is thrown out of turn, it's automatically burnt. So you know how many times Ooh. you've seen people counting like, oh, wait, because it's one player throws the first and the last and then the other player th throws the middle three. So if you that mess you that up, you're, you're done for. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're used to regular curling with just throwing two rocks, you're done for. The rock is burnt. Oh, wow. Um, and I feel finally, better about uh, our little exploit. I don't think we did that. <laughs> and then finally, in 2015 is when they introduced the power play. Okay. Uh, and then finally, in 2018, uh, mixed doubles is introduced to the Olympics. Oh, very interesting. And just, I guess, to make a long story short, if anybody's not really familiar with it, but crazy amounts of offense compared to traditional curling. Oh, and totally. crazy comebacks and big ends by both teams. It's uh, it's a free for all. The scoreboard can swing back and forth many times. And I think if you want to be a really good mixed player, you have to be one resilient and not let yourself be bummed out by the fact that you just gave up four points because it's okay you <laughs> can you take will. five the next one there's no problem and you definitely don't see many blank ends as you would in normal curling because that's one thing that's been kind of annoying me um when watching curling on tv now is that the first three ends are especially with the men's is like the first three ends are all blank yeah and actually you're um you're getting to the point that i can think of and it's that when I'm, well, let's just back up to like mixed doubles when we first might have done it. The earliest memory I have of playing it is um, at the ARCM challenge, which was something that we did as juniors in the Montreal area. Our friend Kevin, who is going to be a guest on our show one day, he would uh, organize a, a Continental Cup style tournament. We would 
take all the juniors in Montreal, put them into two big, big teams, and we would compete in all kinds of things against each other. And it was a lot of fun. And that's when I remember first playing doubles. I don't remember who I played with or whether I won or not, but it was really weird and it was a lot of fun. But then like, as it got more popular, I never bought into it. I was just, I was one of the people who said, ah, this is just a gimmick. Give me the traditional curling. You're one of the skeptics, eh? But I think I know I can clearly define when I converted. And it was when it was at the Olympics. And so two years ago? So two years ago, I was already kind of transitioning. And mm-hmm. then I was going- You drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> I did. And I was at work. And I remember colleagues were talking. And I don't even think they knew I was a curler. But they were just saying, oh, I, did you see the mixed doubles game last night? Oh, yeah, that's so fun. Like, it's way better than the... These are not curlers. And they're, they have, they're the kind of people that are only watching curling once every four years during the Olympics. And they are vocally stating how much better this version of it is. And then I got me thinking, like, yeah, they're right. This really is exciting. And I imagine if you're new to the sport and you want to be drawn into something, watch this. This is a oh, lot of absolutely. fun. absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of the Olympics, I don't know if you remember, but the mixed doubles was played first. Yeah. And it was it was a hit and Canada won. So definitely bonus points for mixed doubles in Canada. But right after the final, then the regular curling started. And That's I think right. the first game was Kevin Cooey. I looked this up too. <laughs> Ke- Kevin Cooey versus was it Italy they were playing against? Does That's that right. Sense? And I think like the first five ends were blanked. Yeah, it was or one like it was four. one nothing. And as someone who doesn't know curling, uh, just watching it on TV, as like most of the people who watch the Olympics do. Like, of course, they'd be turned off by the regular curling. It was so boring. That's right. We had the, I had the same conversation with somebody at the curling club about how mixed doubles had won me over. I don't remember who this was, but they were, oh, no, give me the real curling. That's uh, had, It started that night, and we looked up one nothing after four. Ugh. I rest my case. Well, speaking of uh, first time, first memories playing mixed doubles, um, I actually started playing sometime... After the game first started. So I'd say this would probably be around like 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of heard about it. And at the curling club I was playing at the time, we actually just, we got a a couple people and we formed a little like Saturday afternoon league. Um, I think we had about like six teams. Okay. Yeah. I guess six or eight teams. Anyways, enough to fill like three sheets. And it was a lot of fun and it was mostly couples, right? So this is another great, reason to have a like a mixed doubles league at the club is that or at least in the league we have started it was a lot of couples playing together so husband and wife and these are people who joined the club later in life picked up <laughs> curling as like adults and obviously it's really hard to come into a club and find a four-man team or like a, a women's team or a men's team where as mixed doubles kind of allowed them to play together but anyways, it was a lot of fun. Um, however, one thing that was really funny, and this kind of solidified my, um, I want to say hatred, but my despise of the stabilizer, is that at oh, this yes. club, and obviously you kind of, you know what I'm talking about here, is <laughs> this club kind of automatically puts new curlers on the stabilizer from the get-go, which I think is a no-no. But these People quickly found out that the stabilizer was not going to work for mixed, double, mixed doubles because you, one part of the game is you have to get up and start sweeping after you throw your rock. You know this. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll get to that eventually. But and you can't you can't do that with a stabilizer, right? You can't like chuck your stabilizer away and pick up a broom at the hog line. But you know what? I just want to interrupt there. I wouldn't mind if you if they made some rule like go ahead, you can use a stabilizer. But that's what you're sweeping with. The well, little, yeah. The little pad on the end, you'd have to lean completely over and sweep with this little two foot thing. Yeah. Like, good luck to you. I want to see somebody try it. I'm sure someone <laughs> out there has. Anyways, so to sum up, yeah, like when I started playing, it was before 2015 when the power play didn't exist. And like that, I thought the game was great. I loved it. And then I kind of went on a, a couple year hiatus. And came back and started playing mixed doubles again. And then this is when the power play got introduced. And I had no idea, like, I didn't understand it or really understand the point of it. And I also kind of found it make it made the game a little gimmicky. Yeah. Which is a critique that the mixed doubles game has. 
Yeah, and I think curling in general too. Like it seems a uh, a lot of the rule changes they've made over history, I ultimately agree with, but a lot of them seem to be made kind of quickly. Mm-hmm. I just think of how um, when we started curling, it was a three rock rule, and then a four, and now it's five. It's a uh, it's a kind of a fundamental change in about twenty so years. But mixed doubles, like the power play thing, is really groundbreaking. I think, and I don't really see the point. But well, you see, like I understand the point of the five rock rule, just because it doesn't make a difference at the club level, but at the elite level, just having the four rock free guard zone. The teams got too good with it, and the team's it on wasn't, TV. But the team's on TV, and it's strictly this is the only reason why they brought in the five rock rule yeah. is because of the teams on TV. And basically, when teams got a, a big lead, and for the men's, it could just be like by three points, they go super defensive, right? So just by adding that extra rock kind of helps keep the game a little more interesting. Yeah, and the power play thing. So it is a bit gimmicky, but it does. I'll be honest, it makes it very interesting to watch because it's another thing to juggle. It's like watching football when you're when the coach is, do I call a timeout now? Is it about strategy or is it about time management? And it's just another factor to throw into the game that makes it... I completely it- disagree, Rob. I completely dis. I don't think it brings There's anything... T- yeah, <laughs> I don't think it brings anything valuable to the mixed double games. You want to say it makes something interesting? I'm sorry, but just having five rocks and no takeouts till the fifth no, I, rock I, I, makes it, is already interesting. No, that part I agree with. I I'm not saying it's something necessary. I'm just saying that when will they use it? When you're watching and the team is like, should we use it now? Should we use it later? That thing in the back of your mind is an interesting debate to have. That's true. Okay. But I'll I agree you with that you. Point. I don't see the point of it. I think the game is fully exciting without it. So I tried to browse a little bit on the internet as to see like if people um, have shared their opinions about the power play and also... Um, in terms of strategy, like when it's best to use it and stuff. And basically, what if you play it right, should ensure an extra point. So Mm -hmm. technically, it should be like a guaranteed two. So if you're down and you have the hammer and you're running out of ends, it could be good to do the power play to at least like secure two points. Okay. Yeah. I just, yeah, I find the decision of when to use it interesting. Not that I think it's a necessary thing, but it's kind of like, oh, do I call my timeout now? Do I do that? It's when do you make your move? It's an interesting discussion to have. True. When you make the move could be, is definitely something to consider. But then how much is the move going to, how valuable is the move, you know? Well, that's something, yeah, that's a good question for somebody who actually knows mixed double strategy, yeah. which I really do I know to go for the middle all the time, but that's, well, that's, a, it, the that's game my is- other problem with the power play is everything's off to the side. Now what? The other team can just bring it back to the center if they're that's leading. Always, yeah. And then you're limited to, okay, you got your guaranteed one, let's say. Again, it all depends on if you make your shots or not. So if you're not curling well, um, but also if you're not curling well, the power play could be good in terms of um, momentum. So you've been doing like two or three ends and things haven't gone been going well. Okay, let's do a power play to like rejiggle things, you know, do a little different strategy to help hopefully get your confidence back and change the momentum of the game. On that note, okay, the power play could be good. But besides that, I don't know. I'm not convinced. Uh, so please uh, convince me otherwise. <laughs> Anyone out there? I agree. It's not something that I'm, I, I don't know, passionate about. We have to abolish the power play. I don't care no. that much, but it's, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting thing to have to juggle. You mean you're not going to go on a Twitter rant about this? What's Twitter? I barely know what Instagram is uh, with all of this. So no, I'm not going to go on a Twitter rant. But speaking of uh, ranting, uh, in, my, in my research for this episode, which I did like five minutes before we went online, um, I found an article that I did read. I remember reading this actually two years ago during the Olympics. And it's um, by a columnist from the National Post, Steve Simmons. He's a well-known sports reporter in Canada. And he wrote an article called Mixed Doubles Curling is an Olympic Sham. And <gasps> not all gold medals are created equal. And he's saying that other athletes who won gold deserve more recognition than, uh, than John Morris and Caitlin Laws. Are they like, is he, does he mean... Like the regular curling 
teams well, deserve that, more um, recognition. He said, excuse me if I'm not among the thousands or millions maybe celebrating the gold medal by Canada's mixed doubles team. Mixed doubles invented in the form of these winter games does not belong on the big stage. You know that for this very reason. Most Olympic athletes train their entire lives just to qualify for the games, let alone wind up on any podium. Yet John Morris and Caitlin Laws stood on the podium with gold medals after only okay. having practiced once, which I think is technically true. No, no, no. I just, I, 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 I have a, I yeah, completely rebuttal. disagree. I have a, a big rebuttal. To say that these, the players who compete in mixed doubles have not trained their entire lives is completely and therefore false. are less, is completely false and uh, offensive. Yes. Like, yeah, the rules of the game of mixed doubles is different than regular curling. However, the technical skill that goes into playing mixed doubles is still the same for regular curling in terms of how you throw the rock, you know, weight judgment, line call. Like, yeah, the implication from this article is that um, Caitlin Laws and John Morris walked into a curling club last week and said, oh, what's this? And then wound up at the Olympics the week after. Don't tell me that they didn't train for this their whole lives. For that reason, I'm just going to discredit everything this guy says in the article. Oh, yeah, like, this is a... He clearly a, doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, and he goes on to say... Um, Mixed doubles is a made-up Olympic event added basically because curling draws television numbers and the and this gives TV another sport that fills plenty of hours for broadcasters around the world. Haters going to hate. What can I say? I know. Well, also on that point, I think that mixed doubles is a lot more TV friendly than regular curling. I agree. I mean, my personal experience told me that. So uh, mm -hmm. like I could not disagree with this guy more. The only interesting thing is that I, I mean, and I'm not giving him any credit here at all. But there is an element of truth to the fact that the mixed doubles was not the priority for Caitlin or John. They were, they, had, they were working for four years to get to the Olympics with their regular team. And then they went for this as a secondary thing. And that's true for everybody in Canada, pretty much. Yes and no. So if you take John Morris and Caitlin Law specifically, John Morris was not playing on... Oh yeah, that's the men's right. Team. That's right. He he actually retired retired from men's play and was solely playing mixed doubles for I think, like two or three years before the trials. Caitlin Laws, though, on the other hand, was at the time and still is playing for Jennifer Jones. And I do remember during the Olympic trials because Jones made it pretty far in that. Right. And at the time, uh, Laws had already won her spot for mixed doubles. So they were kind of talking about like what's going to happen if Jones actually ends up winning a sp like a winning the the woman's spot. Like, would they allow Caitlin to play both doubles and women's, or would Jones have to find a new third? Like, which one would she play? Oh, interesting. And well, obviously Jones didn't win, no. so <laughs> it was a moot point. But it's definitely something to consider. And uh, I can, this kind of segues into like another point I wanted to bring up for this episode is that mixed doubles is now starting to like gain more traction in Canada. And a lot of the elite players are kind of jumping on board yes. and playing this, but it's more of a part-time thing. So their men's or women's team is the priority. And this is like a second to that, right? But I think we're going to get to a point, maybe not for the next Olympics, but eventually once mixed doubles becomes more popular that you're going to have two diff like two distinct players like you're either going to focus on mixed doubles or you're going to focus on regular curling yeah i think um well that's it's something that i thought about and again not giving any credit or um to this article but it is something that i do notice that the elite teams pursue the traditional thing and this it is secondary for them but again mm -hmm. to diminish the gold medal in yeah. John Chang is ridiculous from that. Yeah. And uh but I, I actually I kind of like that they prioritize their own teams because it makes the mixed doubles maybe a little bit more open for everybody mm -hmm. or a little bit more accessible for because we've talked about this before. I'm kind of frustrated by the gap between the elite and the not so elite and how it's widening in this country. So at mm -hmm. least if the really competitive curlers are only going to put in a very slight percentage of their effort and dedication into mixed doubles, I think it makes it more accessible for the rest of the country and it gives it some notoriety at the same time. It's uh, kind of the best of both worlds. Oh, for know. sure. I think the, like the reason why we're seeing 
elite players win mixed doubles at the moment is just because of the huge gap in skill level. I think the people who are just playing mixed doubles obviously aren't at the same level as the elite players just because they haven't had the opportunity to get that exposure. But I think give it a couple years for the mixed double sport to develop and you'll get more people on board. And uh... that was uh, your comment there about um, large gaps in, in skill level and non elite. Was that a segue into uh, our mixed doubles exploits? <laughs> no, but we can go there. <laughs> uh, so I guess you want to talk about the story of uh, the great fall of, Oh, well not. Was it? I was thinking first though, um, uh, remember the tournament that we did at our club? about with mixed doubles oh yes, yes. I remember we learned that. a lot from that um and uh so did our friend uh, trish who uh friend of the podcast who um uh capitalized on the popularity of mixed doubles and approached our club and said uh can can i organize a mixed doubles tournament and one of the great decisions she made right off the bat is let's throw out the word mixed and just make it doubles because the the men to women ratio at our club is not good enough oh yeah have. so just you find a partner the club was very receptive, except they only gave her like one day to run a tournament where she had 20 teams interested. To make a draw for 20 teams and fit it in one day, I think we were scheduled to play like eight games, four games. or something. <laughs> it was more than four, I think. Yeah, I think it was four if we made it to the, the playoff. Which we did. I think, it might, I think it was four plus if you made But anyways, it was a lot of games and mathematically it all fit because the games are shorter. The draw made sense, but I remember throwing a rock and running up to sweep it and commenting that, oh, I'm exhausted already. Oh, I remember by the fourth game, both teams were absolutely exhausted. And I think we came to an agreement. We're like, let's just go up and down. And like, that was it. <laughs> so Whoever it a wins, game, like, two up wins. And, down, and everybody was okay with it. It was still a lot of fun. It's, uh, oh, yeah. We enjoyed the tournament. It was it just it's to go exhausting, to show how though. exhausting it is. Yeah. The sprinting after your rock to uh, go sweep it is. Uh, yeah. At championships uh, in the past, I've played three games of like regular curling in one day. And it's exhausting after the third game, not going to lie. It was tiring. However, Playing three games of mixed doubles in one day. Even though you throw fewer rocks. Yeah, and it's is, quicker. It's like twice as exhausting. I agree. Yeah, I really felt it. The nice thing is we did it in April at the very end of the season, and uh, we had a whole summer to relax and gain our strength back. But can you imagine if we had a Tuesday night league game the day after? I, I could. Oh, I remember no, no, no. being completely wrecked for a few days. And that's the thing, like... Yeah, there's fewer rocks and it goes by, but you don't have the stoppage time that you do in regular curling, right? Yeah. Even if you're a sweeper, you have time to walk down to the other end and kind of hang out at the hog line before it's your turn to throw again. Whereas mixed doubles is by the time you walk back, like they've already thrown the rocks, so you have to get ready. It's just... um yeah, it's a lot of back and forth, a lot of mileage. So I guess if you're, if you have, I wonder if someone has uh, played with like a step counter or yeah. something. Yeah, pedometer and see how long, how, how far you walk. I know. I've thought about that a lot during the pandemic, just how I have to follow directional arrow, arrows everywhere I go. I'm like, hmm, I'm probably getting way more steps in when I go to the group <laughs> or even at work, we have these arrows. So. Oh, really? Yeah. It's really annoying if you forgot something in aisle one and you have to backtrack. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, that that um, tournament was super popular, and it was supposed to come back this year. That's right, um, and it got, of course, and it got any, anything in April uh, never happened, sadly. Yeah, sadly. But uh, no, it was definitely a hit at the club, and I know there was talks of maybe starting a league, but and I one think thing, we just have um, a problem with the ice. And yeah, and scheduling. here's actually another, um, well, a couple of thoughts on why clubs should have mixed doubles is that um, a lot of clubs are struggling with membership. But I had the thought, with, hmm, you could fill up every sheet at a curling club with half the number of people, for mm -hmm. one thing. And the other thing, and this is the sadder point, but I think it's true, is that if we have to keep social distancing for a long time, this is the hey, more COVID-friendly approach. It's COVID-friendly, that's true. And you can probably squeeze in an extra draw, too. If you yeah. cut it down to six cents. 
you yeah. can definitely fit three draws in an evening. And like I said, it's great for new members who don't Although know many people in the I'm club. That's not so sure and- about because when a I, when we teach new members, one of the things we tell them is like, always wear a gripper when you're sweeping. Always be very oh, okay. careful. And I have okay. thoughts of like rookies don't, sprinting after the rocks. I don't necessarily mean greens. I just mean okay. like new people. Like let's say I were to move and go to a different club. Right. Um, I guess there's not a lot of people in my situation in Montreal, but just to say, like, you know, if you move to a different club, you don't know a lot of people. Um, it, it could be easy to yeah, get involved. True. And one, like, there's two less personalities to deal with, uh, <laughs> which, hey, is a big thing. <laughs> yes, the less drama, the better. <laughs> it's a huge thing. There's nothing worse than playing with someone you don't like That's on, right. like, a Tuesday night ladder game. What are not, you saying? Not speaking by, <laughs> not speaking from experience here, but you know. But yes, it's supposed to be your relaxing time during the week. Exactly. Yeah. So, anyways, I hope that uh, you know Canada picks up mixed doubles. Yeah, I hope uh, it becomes more of a thing and that uh, people get into it. And uh, this tournament that we did do at our club, we did well, and I think I seem to remember we won. A- some kind of medal. I think we it played in gold, the. I know that, but I. No, we played in the consolation. Okay, yeah, and we won that. I so oh, I remember getting something. So what, we got a bronze. So that was fun, and we did well. And then we got the really good idea. Hey, let's take it to the next level. Let's uh, go for the provincials. And the main deciding factor in this was that the club in which the provincials were played at were ten minutes from our, our home club. So. Yeah, it wasn't far. We weren't really willing to travel for this. So it was um, it was right around the block. And we said, hey, why not? We're the bronze medalists at our club mixed doubles tournament. Clearly, we're ready for prime time. And I think this was our first provincials in like a decade at least. Oh, yeah, because that's one of the things that I forgot about is that normally you just like, hey, want to play this tournament? And we're always like, yeah, well, I'm kind of busy, but okay. But then I forgot about all the things like you have to have matching jackets, you have to get a patch sewn on, and you have to... I I forgot about all of those little things. And this is a struggle for mixed doubles because at least in a a men's or women's team, you can shop in the same department. Can't do that for mixed doubles. Yeah, that was (laughs) Or at least if you have my body type, you can't. No, it was hard to find uh, things that were... I think I I shopped in the boys' section and then we found like a... A jacket that looked exactly the same that was men's sized but yeah a lot of teams just got like uh, unisex hoodies because we weren't sure also how serious people were gonna take it yeah i mean we've we've been to provincials where they inspected the bottom of our shoes and here uh-huh. and where here i don't think anybody cared some people taped their patch onto their arm and it came off whenever they swept yeah no one had names on the backs of their jackets or anything a couple did but most of them didn't and uh yeah most people just did the same thing as we did just bought a cheap hoodie and uh well i think there are a couple people who actually played the circuit by the way thanks to my mom for sewing on the patches (laughs) yeah a little bit better than duct tape well there's definitely a handful of people who definitely played mixed doubles in the circuit um, but I'd say 75% of the people who are competing were kind of like us, just like, oh, this, this is going to be fun. Let's Yeah, it was right after the Olympics. And and, yeah. It, yeah, it was right after the Olympics. I think it had a lot of popularity. And there was a good mix of people that really knew what they were doing and of people that were, hey, let's just try this. And I'd like to think we're somewhere in the middle of that. We're not to say that we know what we're doing, but we've, we've been around the block a little bit. Although, we know enough to be decent. Right. I think we were still seated like last or next to last or something like that. I remember being seated really, really low. And um, we opened up our first game was against uh, probably the greatest mixed doubles curler in Quebec, Robert Desjardins, with uh, with his daughter. And uh, he's w- not only won the province, he's won Canada before for mixed doubles. Yeah. Not with his daughter, but with no, another, but, another but player. But he's yeah. extremely decorated. He's been all... He was he, one of the... He was one of the first to jump on the mixed doubles bandwagon. That's right. So he's ahead of the curve. He's He's been around and he's, um, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard, I, look Ooh. at us just throwing out, out rumors and things, but like, well, he's a math teacher. I know that. And that he can compute your statistics in his head. 
Yeah, as he's calling a game, he'll be like, well, I'm going to give you an outturn for this shot because you're curling 72% on your outturn versus 93 on your in I remember him talking about this after the game when we had like our, our lunch and I was just like, oh, I don't even remember what happened two ends ago. <laughs> like, yeah. How do you keep track of this? Me neither. He He's a, a curling genius, uh, safe to say. And um, so we were pretty intimidated. Uh, it's quite a way to start your first ever mixed doubles provincials going up against uh, against him and his daughter. And I don't remember how, or actually I do remember I think they had hammer. They tried some kind of shot on their last shot that wasn't really there. I don't think they ended up taking out one of their own and we stole four in the opening end. It was a tricky shot. It was a high risk shot. Like they missed it the mo like the worst possible way. Right. I don't, it was, but I remember that was a lot more likely than any positive outcome. It was not mm -hmm. a great thought or not a great idea to go. It wasn't for. a good call. It wasn't a good call. No. And we stole four. And I remember just looking at you going like, what happened? And they were not happy. Oh, no. <laughs> they instantly called their power play. And it was, it was what, in the second end? It was really it was early on. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Their power play goes in the second end, which, again, I don't know anything. Um, and we killed their penalty. Um, mm. Or we killed the penalty, if that makes sense to borrow a hockey term. I don't even know. But they only either we stole or they only got one. Like we were in great shape. Unfortunately, I have no idea how to defend a lead in mixed doubles. No, we had a couple. Well, <laughs> there isn't <laughs> maker shots, basically. Um, but no, yeah, we did not end up winning that game. But it came down to the wire. It was really close, yeah, and it we was had just. A shot a for the win. But it was just. It wasn't that we played badly or we didn't know the strategy. It just came down to us missing like two or three key shots had we made those shots like we would have probably shook before uh, the 10 ends yeah it was or what how many it's eight ends in mixed i don't even remember uh, i don't know i don't i think this one was 10 still i think it i think it's i don't even remember that's yeah, how not important. i am with yeah but anyways yeah. um it was uh yeah it was but just to say okay i'm like i don't think they were that much better than us I, I don't know, but in it, terms of shot making, but for me, what it meant was that anything can happen here. It's mm -hmm. uh, a team like us can beat a really, really good team, and then we went on to lose to another team that I thought was uh, I with with respect behind us. Yeah, and but we also played like shit. Okay, <laughs> like, well, we did that. not play well. <laughs> there's that, but it doesn't take much. It doesn't take no, it everybody doesn't. misses, or you you watch on TV and regular curling, an elite player will miss one shot not a big deal but here they they're human they make mistakes and you can burn them for them if you make your shot i think mixed doubles is a lot less forgiving than regular curling is because in regular curling if you don't make a shot you have other people to come and bail you out and there's also more shots to come bail you out whereas mixed doubles is like if you miss a shot there goes your end yeah, I rem and that's the nice thing uh, is that I remember feeling kind of badly about that game, thinking, "Oh man, if we, if only we knew better strategy, we would have been able to hold on." But I don't think we. It's just I don't think we did anything wrong strategy wise. Maybe we did, but really, it was just you got to make shots for the whole whole game. And mm -hmm. uh, and you have to I, be I technically actually good. right. I did make one really good shot in that game, which you probably don't remember. <laughs> I think you remember the shot that came before it. <laughs> Yes, I do. Yes, so this was uh, in the same game. Uh, this is something that uh, Kelly will remind me of until the day I die. Um, so, or one of the problems I noticed is that we had to play with legal broomheads, which in our club curling life nowadays, um, I barely ever use them. I was just going to say, yeah, the club, the broomhead I use at the club, it's, I've probably been using for the past three years. Yeah, I remember <laughs> the days when we used to go through like... Uh, hundreds of them yeah and so we had to put on elite bro or whatever they're legal broom heads sorry the the bright yellow ones and i we have a couple but i mean they're they they slide much there's less friction they really go mm -hmm. and so i'm throwing some kind of run back in this game and i i guess it's a little bit inside and i decide to chase my own run back which is just well in fact is i called idea. you to, i called you to sweep it like okay yeah so I'm I'm sprinting down the on my slider and I try to catch I caught up to it at just about maybe the hog line. 
<laughs> well, enough to get like two strokes in. Also, to paint a picture of what the end was like, I think every rock was in play. Oh, yeah. And there and were a ton of guards. Yeah. There was like maybe three rocks in the house. Everything else was a guard. That's right. So I'm moving as fast as I can and I lean in there with my broom and I'm expecting to start sweeping, but it just goes out from under me. It, I already made my excuse. It's got less friction, so it just goes flying. <laughs> and uh, I went down <laughs> and I, I'm sliding towards these like five guards and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, my thought is I, I can do this. I can get out of the way. I can kind of hop over this and not burn anything. Well, I think that's every curler's natural reaction is you're like, I'm going down and I'm going to try and go down without touching anything. That's right. But I just want to give credit to myself because I don't think anybody who's gone down was going as fast as I was going. This is I'll like, give you uh, that. I'll yeah. give you that. And so I, I see this guard coming and I try to like raise, I don't know, my arm, my leg, whatever part of me was on the ice to get over it. And I almost did, but then I gave way and I just ended up hitting, bulldozing a good <laughs> six whole, You basically cleared the front. And <laughs> if only you were allowed to do that, I, I opened the whole front. But it's kind of funny because, well, no, it wasn't funny because you're we were concerned for your, your well-being. Good, because one of the things I was going <laughs> to ask was like, I don't remember that. I remember like not Kelly being, <laughs> was, oh my God, my teammate, is he hurt? Is he? It was so bad. But also to paint a, a better picture, you kind of, in, in your attempts to avoid touching rocks, you kind of, <laughs> you kind of like planked a little bit and was sliding across the the guard air the well, guard it's zone. As if I tried to take them out. It's as if I <laughs> lay flat on the ice and tried to bear hug them all like off the ice. It, yeah, but then the next thing, once we've kind of uh, settled down, we were just like us and also the other team. We were like, how how are we going to put the well, rocks back? What I was thinking is like, where the heck does everything go? But Robert Desjardins, being the human strategy. Uh, computer that he is knew where every rock was and before I could even look he had gone up and put everything back the way it mm. was I was like okay I kind of know the rocks in the path that we were going for because that's what I was like paying attention to but the rest was like oh like these two are like kind of on the center line but I don't remember exactly if they were just touching or like a quarter on the center line yeah, he knew exactly so. where to put them, and it's. Uh, I mean, we all know when you uh, like, like the free when you violate the free guard zone to put the rock back. You know roughly where it was, but I wiped out a good five rocks here. Oh yeah, so it's who not the like hell you knows just, where they go? But he did. Yeah, it's not like you just ticked it with your foot; like you you bulldozed it. Yeah, everything. And he knew where every rock went. I was really impressed. It confirmed that whole rumor to me of like, can he keep stats in his head? Well, if he knows where every rock is, I bet he can. Yeah. Sure. And, uh, and the funny thing is that I had the same run back on my next shot and I made it and <laughs> yeah. you called me to sweep and I was like, hell no, I'm not sweeping. it." <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing with doubles is because except for the first shot where usually both players are going to be at one end, you towards the end, especially for throwing takeouts, it, there's a tendency for someone to stay in the house. And so you really have to be good and confident in your balance to throw the rock and then get up and chase your rock and start sweeping. Which I thought I was until that yeah. day. It's not too bad when you're throwing a guard or a, a draw, but if you're throwing peel weight, it's you basically have to let the rock go. <laughs> yep, that's you're a, probably a lesson we learned the hard way. But anyway, to, to, to wrap up that story, we did not win the provincial mixed double championship that way. No, yeah. but I think we held our own pretty well for a team yeah. that um, decided like a couple weeks before, hey, let's enter this. It's not like we'd been training for it for, uh, I think we practiced a couple of times, but yeah, but it yeah, and we learned a lot. Enough. It was fun. Yeah, I guess next time it's uh, the championship is happening in the city, maybe we'll consider it. Yeah, I come I back think out we, of retirement. We probably should. We will have legions of followers now, thanks to this podcast. Oh, for sure. Maybe we'll have a couple sponsors too to fund our endeavors. There you go. I guess we could do another episode later on if we want to do a deep dive and strategy and how best to play. Yeah, for that I, I need to like see actual curling. Like it's hard for me to even think strategy when I haven't seen anything. Yeah. In we have to see some games where they use a the power play and yeah go i remember there. watching one or two like before we played to try and get a grip on when to use the power play it didn't help yeah <laughs> even we i don't think we used it that much 
I, like, no, we I definitely mean, we must have, we would have, but. Yeah, I think we used it when things weren't going well and to like change it up. But what I do definitely... remember is that it never worked. It's not like we ever yeah. cracked a four with the power play. It was like we, either we only took one or gave up a steal. Or... Well, I think the only way to crack a four with the power play is if the other team misses every shot. Which, hey. It... <laughs> anyways, we can, we can dig deeper into that uh, in another episode. For sure. So make a long story short, uh, we're very much in favor of mixed doubles, unlike Steve Simmons. Yes, we love mixed doubles, and I hope that you do too. All right, <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>